Welcome to SEC Sports Roundtable. This is going to be episode 81. So if you've not uh, listened in for a while, there's been good reason for that. We've taken a little summer hiatus ourselves here. Uh, but back at it tonight uh, for week one of our SEC football preview. So over the next seven weeks uh, leading up into opening weekend, we're going to get uh, seven weeks, seven sets of teams, or seven, yeah, seven sets of teams for all 14 SEC uh, football programs and get right into the action after some introductions and some housekeeping. But uh, welcome aboard, Drew Young. Shane, it's, it's good to be back. Uh, I, I would say that it's nice to, to see you and, and, and talk with you, but I'm really more excited because when we start doing these, it means that uh, football season's just around the corner. Hey, I, I'm not a pretty face to look at either, so I can understand. I don't know why anyone watches the, the video version. And I, and I just noticed, throw up that cup real quick just for a second. Did I just see... That's hilarious. That was not scripted. Is that what you're using too? Yeah, McDougal's. Are they sponsoring us? That'd be nice. That would be nice. Uh, so anyways, you, you never know what's in those cups. It's like Blake Shelton's cups on The Voice if you ever watch that. Yeah. You got uh, your, your choice of beverage. So, But uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not a pretty face to look at here, but uh, good news is you're right. Uh, we're we're uh, in the thick of getting ready for football, and if you keep up with football in any stretch, you know, you really realize that it, it starts to kick into high gear, I think, after this week, uh, if you're an SEC fan, because uh, media days start this week, if I'm not correct, you know, Tuesday down in, uh, down south, and so it, it, after that, you really start to see the excitement start to build. You start to hear from players and coaches and all the media's down there getting all that information out to to the fans like ourselves, and so it, it really lets us know that football truly is right around the corner. Well, I think the the cool thing, uh, especially this year, is I mean, every year you can make the case for all the teams to say there's a reason to be excited. You know, a new year brings you know uncertainty, and you kind of start the uh, with a clean slate. But this year in particular, there were so many coaching changes in the SEC. I think there's something to be excited about for everybody because pretty much anybody that has a coach that was on the hot seat went ahead and pulled the trigger. So. You know, we've got new coaches in Arkansas and Auburn and, and at Tennessee and in Kentucky. Uh, so, I mean, there's there's plenty of jobs where there's a new coach, and, and pretty much everybody is either on a high because they won or did well at the end of last season or they got a new coach. So, um, and, and I don't know the exact numbers. I can't remember how many. I think nine or nine teams might have made bowl games last year, and I think the four that didn't, like three of them got new coaches. So, something to be excited about in the SEC uh, with a lot of teams. So, I know as a Tennessee fan, I'm excited, and I know as a Kentucky fan that you're super excited with what they've done with football, and, and pretty much any other team that's out there has a reason to be pumped up right now. Yeah, it's like you know, spring spring uh, brings eternal newness and all that, and the same thing happens with, with football as you start rolling around with some of these programs. Uh, and and you start, everybody starts with uh, zero wins, and more importantly for, for some fans, zero losses. Uh, so you're, you're right in, in that aspect of things. Uh, we're going to talk about one of the teams you mentioned tonight. Like I, like I mentioned, um, we're starting our week one of previews. And so if you're new to SEC Sports Roundtable, uh, the way we've done this over the last two years, this is our third year for doing previews. Can you believe that, Drew? Yeah, it's, it's incredible that we've done this for three years. Yeah, we're starting year three. Uh, but the way we're, we've been doing it, it seems to be more effective, is that we're going to take two teams and look at those for each week over the next seven weeks. And so uh, as we get closer to the, the football season, you're probably going to get more and more information on some of those programs only because you know, we're still right now in the middle of July. So there's still some information uh, that we don't know. There's a lot to shake out on on who might be or who might not be the starting quarterback for some of these programs. And we'll try to talk about that and sit, tell you who we think and why we think that. But, uh, you know, there's there's some things to come. And so as we get closer to the season, it's going to be a little easier for some of those. But there's a lot that's going to be determined at this point. Uh, and we're going to be able to cover that, uh, give you an idea of where we think these teams will go. Uh, last year we looked at the wins and losses. Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that again this year. We'll pull up their schedules towards the end of this. And, and give you guys uh, our opinions on on where we think they'll shape out. And if you are new to the the roundtable, welcome aboard. We're so glad to have you. We do this uh, weekly. We will be doing it weekly from here on out uh, for for throughout the football season, definitely. Uh, so be sure to catch in on iTunes, on uh, YouTube. We have a YouTube channel, SCCSRT. 
I will see, you'll see Facebook updates. You can listen to it, watch it there. About anywhere you can get an RSS or a podcast feed, we're going to find us right there. So we're, we're glad to have you, and if you're new to the program, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, you can tweet us at SECSRT or on the Facebook page, same, same uh, SECSRT. That's the easy way to find us. If you search that in any way, shape, or form, you're going to find a way to connect with us that works for you. So welcome aboard, and let's get right into things. I know we've got one other host we're going to make that introduction. His name is Blair Smiley. Uh, for those that have listened, uh, very familiar with Blair. He's been on quite a bit, and so he's having some technical difficulties uh, set to join us here shortly. But we're going to roll right into things. Um, any news you want to cover before we start looking at some of these picks, Drew? I know there's been a few headlines, but I don't know if they're worthy of talking about. Or um, Yeah, well, let me, before we say that, I, I just want to piggyback on something else. You know, you said... This is a good time to go ahead and tell people if you haven't listened to the podcast, just to kind of explain a little bit. We're not journalists. We're not um, media members. We're, we're fans. Um, we wear our, our uh, emotions on our sleeves a lot. I know I, I do, and Blair definitely does as well. Um, and when it comes to basketball season, Shane, you're kind of in the same boat with Kentucky. So I think that's what's fun is we offer a fan's perspective, and we, we're generally knowledgeable about SEC sports. But, you know, if you're coming here to, to learn about, you know, uh, all the news and stuff like that, and to get some in in depth analysis from from fans, you definitely come to the right place. Because, like I said, we're you know we all have regular jobs, and we we do this because we love we love our teams and we love SEC sports. But um, I think that's what kind of separates us from some of the other uh, either shows or podcasts that are out there. Is that we definitely do it from a fan's perspective, and we we like to razz each other and and, and talk smack to each other, which we can definitely do uh, very well. Yeah, we're not, and we're not afraid to. Um, I think the news, the big. Go on. Hey, I, I think the big news, and this is funny that we're going to, you know, we're going to be talking football. I think the big news right now is is basketball with uh, Ole Miss and Marshall Henderson getting suspended from the team for, I think they found uh, marijuana and cocaine in his car, uh, and he's been suspended, and we don't know if he's coming back or not. But yeah, but are we really surprised? I mean, just look at the way he acts. I mean. Yeah, I don't have a problem with it. I, I'm fine with him. I mean. Uh, I actually hope he does come back. I think he's fun to watch, uh, and I think it makes SEC more exciting in, in a year when we need some excitement in basketball because you're, you know, once again you've got Kentucky and you've got Florida, and, and then everybody else is kind of trying to play catch up. So I, I'd hate it if the the marquee player is doesn't even get to play this year. Yeah, I mean, you're you're right about that. And I mean, you look at Ole Miss; they were, you know, the shining star from the SEC basically this year. Uh, in the postseason, and, and a lot of it was riding on Marshall Henderson's shoulders. Uh, I'd love to get Blair's perspective on this, you know, being a Mississippi State fan. You know he's got to be ecstatic about bad news coming from, from that camp because, you know, they just came off some bad news from themselves from the football side of things just a, a few weeks prior to that. And I know that we talked about that on a couple of episodes ago. So if you want to, just go back and check Episode 80 uh, on that, and we'll talk, we talked about the Mississippi state issues on the, the football suspensions and what their, their sanctions. But uh, you're right about that. From, from the basketball perspective, uh, they, they make a, a case to be an exciting football pro, or a basketball program, and that is something that the SEC needs. I mean, if you look at all the realignment, I think Dennis Dodd put a, an article out uh, that I read not too long ago just talking about all the conference realignments, and, and that's the one thing that he even had to take a jab at the SEC because that's the only thing you can take a jab at on the SEC through all this realignment shakeup is that our basketball programs aren't where they need to be. And so you're right, the excitement factor has to be there um, to, to make everybody better. We need, we need more programs to be good to make everybody better. So, Yeah, that's, that's true. But enough basketball, and thank God Blair's not here. We'd have to relive uh, the College World Series, which I'm sure he was pumped about with Mississippi State, but... I'm fine with just saying, you know, congratulations on a, what a second place finish this year. So yeah, and their first is that their first College World Series appearance? I think I heard that. I don't know. I'm sure it's not. I know they uh, probably in a long time. I, I'm, they had I to have gone back in the '80s. I think like I meant finals. I'm sorry. Yeah, I, Blair would could rattle off every single College World Series final in the history of baseball. So uh, yeah. he's the one to ask that question to. Uh, it's incredible is how much I like. Major League Baseball and how much I dislike college baseball. Well, that's a good question. Do you keep up with the draft stuff uh, for baseball? I know because you you do the the fantasy baseball and everything. Do you keep up with all of those things? I mean, no. I mean, 
I, it's weird because I mean I watch I watch the the first few picks of the draft this year, but it it just doesn't translate as much because you have guys that that don't you know there's not like it's not like basketball or football where they can make an impact. It's usually two or three years down the road before they ever do anything. Now there is an occasion where there's a pitcher or somebody that can that can step in the next year, uh, kind of late in the season, but it, it's it's just too hard to really follow. And half the players are from junior colleges or from high school, and it's it's something that I, I look at just to see if I notice a big name like when a Strasburg's out there, or Bryce Harper, somebody like that. But other than that, it's just it's something to watch. I don't think it. I don't. I think the I think the games are so different. I think Major League Baseball and college baseball is vastly different with the with the metal bat and the wooden bat. I think it's almost a different sport. Yeah, but I think I mean over the last few years and. In- like you said, Blair's the guy we need to talk about baseball, but haven't they made changes to the bat? So even though it's a metal bat and it's it sounds like I'm sorry, yeah, it sounds like a metal bat. It's got that ting, but it more it reacts more like a wooden bat will, does it not? I mean, it's got the 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 ball coming <clears throat> off as far as bat head speed and and velocity and all the things that you look at from a wooden bat perspective. Uh, they've kind of re tried to reproduce that inside the metal bats. Yeah, I, I, it's funny that that you mentioned this. I talked to a guy that uh, a buddy of mine that I'm working with this summer, and he was a minor league pitcher for the in the Twins organization. He he pitched as high as Double A and um, pitched for two or three years, and he, he's done now. But I asked him, you know, the difference between. I said, what would it be like if if they used a metal bat in Major League Baseball? He said, it's just just incredibly. They would, you know, they would have somebody die or something. I mean, he he was just saying that the the ball comes off so much harder off a metal bat than a wooden bat. That it's just it's completely different, and, and and I agree. I mean, I don't know why that makes as much of a difference as it does, but it just seems different to me. Well, I mean, I know it used to be that, and and I, I thought that they'd done something with the the metallic makeup, the the chemical compounds inside the bat to make that metal different to react more to slow that bat head speed or the ball coming off the bat. I don't I don't know. Yeah, I don't. I mean, I know they they've changed the weights. It used to be that you could have a bigger drop in like from length to the weight like it used to be that if you had a 32 inch bat you could you could use a 27 ounce bat or something which is a five drop you know 32 minus 27 and now I think it's like you know you can only go down three which is and that's the same through like high schools and like junior highs now but um, I think that makes a big difference uh, obviously with bat head speed and stuff like that but yeah I mean, you might be right with the material I don't know the answer to that but if you're gonna do that then why not just get I guess they say is it a cost thing? Maybe it's a cost thing why they don't do that because I think that's it. I mean, because you're never, you're hardly going to ever go through an aluminum bat unless you take it to the, to the side of a, the building or something like that. But a, a, a wooden bat has a number of issues with cracking and breaking and expenses from there. And, sure. And and those can get expensive. I mean, if you've ever shopped a really good wooden bat, I mean, those things get up there in price. Yeah, I would imagine that's probably a good point. I mean, you, you look at some of these. College programs and and they can't go through, you know, 150 bats a year. So maybe they can. I don't know. So all right, we're trying to get a visitor over here. My, my three-year-old son's hmm. want to cooperate tonight, so we apologize if you're hearing that in the background. But let's get let's switch gears and go into our football. Um, looks like we're going to talk about Auburn and Missouri. Do you have a choice or a preference there, Drew? I know neither let's, one of them we're going to be experts in. Let's start with Missouri because that's who I've got up on my computer right now. All right, I've got a few notes. I'll I'll switch my pages here. You want to want to kick off and tell me what your thoughts are? Yeah, I mean I think Missouri is going to be a, a middle of the road team. Uh, last year they were it's a, you know they're five and seven, two and six in the SEC. Uh, I think the big thing obviously is that they're returning uh, James Franklin at quarterback. So uh, one thing that you'll hear us talk about a bunch is the stability at quarterback makes a big difference um, unless you have a, a Manziel or something like that uh, coming up. So I think that that's big. They they return I think seven starters on offense and and uh, and about the same number on defense, like six or seven. So they were actually returning quite a bit. And they were really hot last year. Or no, I'm sorry, I'm mixing up. They they I said they were really hot last year. I totally switched teams. Um, I think that they're going to be one of the. I think they finish about the same this next year. I don't think they're. Uh, I think their offense is going to be a little ahead of their defense. They've got uh, that. Doriel Green Beckham kid is supposed to be a good receiver, and they return um, 
another starting receiver. So who knows? I, I think it's once again they're they're going to feel the pain a lot worse than Texas A&M joining the SEC. Texas A&M was just on a different level, and they kind of came in and were able to you know play with the big teams. And, and Missouri just kind of took their lumps last year, and I think it'll kind of be another situation similar to that this year. Yeah, I, I'm going to disagree a little bit. Um, you know, I think what hurt Missouri more than anything last year was the injury bug. I mean, if you you look at James Franklin, I think he only start he played in nine games. I don't think he started all of those, and for a, a majority of those, he had to go. You know, he didn't play the whole game. Uh, concussion, what foot injury, ankle injury, shoulder injuries. Um, you know, he was just riddled with injuries. Their starting line, four of the you know four of the the linemen were out with with injuries of some sort. So. You know, the stability you're looking for on an offensive program was just riddled with injuries. Um, this this year, you're right, Franklin's back, he's healthy. Um, you know, but all, all indications are that he's not the starter. Um, the good news is he's, he's had some tutelage this year in the offseason to work on some footwork and some minor changes and things like that. But, you know, as I was doing some prep work for this, it, it was just like, we were sitting here, and, and I'd have to go back and re-listen to the podcast, but we were talking about how great James Franklin was going to be um, and, and how he was going to probably have the chance or opportunity to be a top-tier quarterback in the SEC. Um, and if you look at everything this year, he's, he's struggling to be the starter. He's going to have to uh, really fight for that. And, and you know, Burke Stresser was a, one of the, the guys last year. He's now a sophomore. Uh, he was, a tr I think, a true freshman that had to come in and, and relieve Franklin, and then they're bringing in this Matty Mock guy that's a, a freshman that, that they're that, that at least the fans are excited about, and that could just be because they were so disappointed in the quarterback play last year. I, I don't know. I, I didn't get to research Matty Mock, but it wasn't there a, a, another quarterback with the last name of Mock that, that played in the SEC? Uh, there was a Matt Mock, yeah. I think he played at uh, LSU a few years back. And that was spelled uh, M-A-U-K, right? M A U C K maybe okay. maybe I don't know I, um, I didn't get to sure. see if that was a, a relative or not but uh, that would be interesting if it was but he's he's coming in as far as that goes uh, but they are returning I think four or five of those uh, O line and now they're getting healthy so you get those things in place you get some running backs uh, you know last year that Henry Josie kid he didn't play the the whole year um, and and the year before you know he's one of those tailbacks that everybody was looking at. So he's back, he's healthy, um, and you're going to get some depth there. I think they've got a guy named Marcus Murphy uh, that's going to be able to ha share some reps back there. So so they're solidifying a lot of things on the offensive line, but the one thing that, or the offense in general, not just the line itself, and you're right, you've got uh, DGB uh, that's back as a sophomore. He really started to improve last year, uh, the last half of the season. I don't think he started the season like everybody thought he would, just coming out being, was he the number one overall pit, um I know yeah, he was the top-rated recruit in the nation. Yeah, I know he was the number one receiver. I couldn't remember if he was the overall number one or not. But, you know, you've got him him coming back. So you've got some pieces in place in the offense. You look at the, the total numbers there, and, and that's that's encouraging for, for Missouri. I say that, but then all of a sudden you got to go look at their record, and we can kind of talk about that now if you want to. But all of a sudden all that good news doesn't look so good. If you, you, you compare what their talent level is versus what you – what you have to, to fight up against, and and to me they're they're not making a lot of improvements there. Um, you know they they start off with a, with a great stretch. You know they're they're going to be so excited to have to go four and zero in my opinion. Uh, you've got Murray State, Toledo, Indiana, and Arkansas State as your first four opponents. Yeah, I, I think that that's the that's the case with a lot of these teams. Is you're going to have these stretches where. I agree. I mean, that's four games that you would imagine they should be favored in. They've got three of those at home, and then they play Indiana on the road. And, and you know, unless I'm mistaken, Indiana I don't think is, you know, a powerhouse by any measure. Yeah. Then they've got, you know, they're playing at Vanderbilt and then Georgia, Florida, and then South Carolina. So, you know, it's one of those things where you're starting off 4-0, and and then and by all means, I mean, they there's a good chance they'd be 4-4 four and four after the first eight games. That's exactly I think, where I was going with that. You're right. I mean, Vanderbilt, Georgia, Florida, South Carolina, now you're 4-4 four and four, sitting in there to have Tennessee, who we'll talk about much later in, in our podcast previews, but a much better and much be much improved program that, you know, that could be a toss-up. Yeah, and, and, and back to what you were saying, and I, I haven't followed as much, but here's my thought is if, if James Franklin 
is not your starting quarterback. If, if he's struggling to the point where they're talking about somebody else playing over him, that, that just that scares me to the fact that I mean this guy's a, a two-year starter. I know he had some injury concerns last year, but I mean. If he can't win this job outright, then I think they're going to have trouble at the quarterback position. I don't think that this Burke Sasser kid is is the answer unless he's improved greatly from last year because he got plenty of time last year and didn't set the world on fire. And he actually had just as good, you know, depending on how uh, Beckham improves over the year. I mean, they, they lost two of their top three receiving threats. Um, they, they're losing their big running back, uh, Kendall Lawrence, last year. Um, had a good year. I mean, he was one of the better, you know, lesser-known running backs, over 1,000 yards rushing, I think 12 touchdowns. So having to replace all that, if you don't have that quarterback, then, then I just think that's that's just another thing that they're going to have to worry about. I mean, that's just trouble if they don't have that. I mean, that should be one thing. A senior who coming into a senior year who's who's had, you know, 20 games of starting experience, and you can't even if you can't count on him, then I think that that's a, that's a big concern in my opinion. I don't disagree with that, but uh, you know, I think I think when it's all said and done, he's going to win. Franklin's going to win out that job as the as the quarterback, and uh, yeah, you just I, some of that could just be you know just coach talk to try to motivate your players. Sure, and I, I mean there were some games I didn't watch a ton of Missouri games last year, but there were games that I thought I thought he looked really good. I thought he was their their biggest weapon, and and yeah, I mean. Maybe it is just something to, to get him riled up a little bit, but you know they're they're going to have to be good on offense. I think that their their bread and butters they're going to have to outscore some people because if you look last year, you know their defense didn't you know didn't set the world on fire. Just their last three games, they you know they let up forty eight points, thirty one points, and then fifty nine points. So um, they're going to have to they're going to have to score on some people, and they've got that kind of wide open offense. So I don't have last year's schedule in front of me, but those last three programs were they. Uh, would one of those Tennessee, one of those Kentucky? Yeah, uh, well Tennessee was, um, and then Syracuse and Texas A and M. So, okay. so they played some pretty explosive offenses. I mean, all three of those. I mean, you're you're looking at the quarterbacks. I mean, two of them were drafted, or well, two of them are on NFL squads, and the other one was a Heisman Trophy winner. So, obviously, they they played against some uh, some pretty good opponents at the you know offenses at least at the end of the season. Yeah, but uh, I think you're right about some of those things. But I, I think. Again, I think their offensive is going to be much improved over last year. Um, but you, you finish looking at that schedule that we started looking at, it's it's not an easy task. Uh, we talked about the first four. Vanderbilt we'll talk about later. They're going to be – I think I'm, I'm going to have to give them the win. Um, it's, at, it's at Vanderbilt, and you know, for all the talk we talk about, that doesn't mean that Vanderbilt's a, a hostile – environment to come into, but it's still a home game for Vanderbilt, and they're getting better with that. Georgia, um, I'm going to give them the, Georgia the win there. Florida, I'm going to give them, I mean, all four of these are top 25 ranked programs preseason that they're going to have to play. Um, are they better when, yeah, are they better when that Vanderbilt game, or they're, you know, it doesn't, I can assure you it doesn't get any easier, easier with Georgia, Florida, and then South Carolina, so. You're, yeah, and I mean, if you look at that, realistically, I'm giving them four and four after after their first eight games, and then you look at the last four games they have, they're going to have to pull out two victories here, and Tennessee is going to be much improved. I believe Kentucky is going to be much improved. Ole Miss was a, a much better program last year than anybody gave them credit for. Uh, and then, and they then they're not. Uh, sorry, go on. Yeah, they're not winning. I was just going to say they're not winning that Texas A&M game. And yeah, and they're you not know. winning that Texas A&M game. So you've got three games there: Ole Miss, Kentucky, and Tennessee. You've got to win two of those to be bowl eligible. Or otherwise, you're back in the same boat you are this year, uh, and, and when and, and, and realistically, you're two and six in the SEC again. Yeah, so, I I agree. I think that that's I think they're looking at kind of the same similar record. I think they're five and seven, six and six. So for all the things we talk about, how they're going to be a better program, um, I think it's going to be incremental, and all the other programs that they have, they're playing that that. You could look at last year and say they had a chance to win. They're also improving, so that's going to be really tough for them to even even get to that six win bowl eligibility thing. Welcome to the SEC. I mean, that's just that's I think that's what, that'll be a recurring theme with all of these teams that we'll talk about at the beginning. All of these teams that were on the outside looking in last last year, you just don't get weeks off. I mean, you don't get to play. I mean, even if you've got an easier schedule in the SEC now, I mean, you're still playing four teams in the top 25 every year. It doesn't matter which division you're in. 
Yeah, I mean, the good news is that there's eight teams, yeah. Because there's eight teams, you know, that are generally in the top 25, four from the east, four from the west. And and this year, five of their eight teams that they're, they're playing are in the top 25. Pretty yeah. Um, I don't know. I don't know what I'm looking. I'm looking at rivals, and they've got uh, Georgia at number five and Texas A&M at number five. I don't know if they've got those two tied, but uh, or, or, I haven't even looked at preseason rankings. I, the only okay. reason I'm seeing it is it's it's listed next to them on their schedule. I'm looking at on rivals. Uh, yeah. But you're looking at five of eight programs that are going to be in the top 25. And I would think that if you looked at it right now, Ole Miss is probably in the others receiving vote category. Yeah, I would imagine they'd be close. So. And Tennessee and Kentucky's not. But, you know, still that being said, you got six in the top 30 maybe. Yeah. Of the, of the eight teams you're playing. Good news for them, like I, like I was saying, was Alabama is not on their schedule. So you do have that. You know, one one nice thing to have to say, but like you said, you got Texas A&M, who, who some think might be able to give Alabama um, some competition for the West this year. So, yeah, other, than, other than the fact that the Heisman Trophy winner will be kicked off the team before the the middle of the season, so that's my bold, that's my bold prediction. Um, the uh, there was some news about that today. It looks like Blair's out; his computer's died on him. So it's just me and you, Drew. Yeah, he got. Um, yeah, this is how it started, man. He he got kicked out of the Manning Passing Academy. Yeah, exactly. Uh, he was ill. Some people are thinking it might be a hangover. Is what. I wouldn't doubt it. Well, he. I mean, if he had to, if he had a, the Scooby Doo outfit on, you never know. Yeah. <laughs> so if you're a Missouri Tiger fan, uh, you know, like like Drew said just a little bit ago, welcome to the SEC. Uh, year two, the the sophomore slump might be upon you guys here, and and you're gonna have a a, a rough go of it here. So we're, uh, I know me and you're gonna hope hope that that's the case because looking at our schedules as as fans of UK and Tennessee, we're needing wins at that slot. Oh uh, yeah, I mean Tennessee that that kept Tennessee from bowl game last year, and, and might be the case again this year. And, it very well could be, yeah. You look at Kentucky, I know we're, we're, we're foreshadowing here and we don't get too far ahead of things, but Kentucky always has Louisville on the schedule, and what's Louisville preseason? I know they've got to be a top ten program. Yeah, I know they've got Bridgewater coming back. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at one rating right here, and Ole Miss is number 25, which, I mean, that's going to be yeah, it's unbelievable. There's like nine teams in the SEC in the top 25. Um, Louisville... They're number 18 in, in one of these that I'm looking at. But, I mean, yeah, I mean, that's, that's they're a top 20 program for sure, so that's just going to be a tough game. So, you know, as a Kentucky fan, you hate seeing that one on the schedule this year. So, well, let's let's switch gears and now go to the West. We, we covered our East team, and that's how we'll do this is we'll do one East, one West. Uh, and look at uh, Auburn. And Drew alluded to, you know, programs having new head coaches. Uh, this is somewhat of a new head coach for this program since he's only been out, out, away from the program a year and basically uh, ran ran the, the Heisman Trophy winning uh, program of Cam Newton. So you know, welcome welcome back, Gus Malzahn. Uh, and yeah, I think the the big thing with him is I mean they're they're coming off zero and eight zero and eight season in the SEC last year. Thirty three. So. I, I saw that thirty three years. Um, since they've been 0-8 in the SEC, or winless. They, they didn't have eight games back then, but since they were winless in the SEC. That's kind of incredible. Um, so to, think to, of all the Auburn fans over the last decade or two. It's kind of like you guys with the 90s. Uh, you guys have been spoiled with, with Auburn's performance. I mean, the last 15, 20 years, Auburn's really had a program that's been able to be um, towards the top in an elite program. To, to go 0-8, you know, that's that's unheard of, and you can understand why. Why there's a new head coach at the at the helm there down on the plains? Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, it's that's the tough thing is once again. I mean, you look at their and we'll go through their schedule here in a minute. But I mean, that you know they don't have an easy schedule again. I mean, they they've kind of they've done a good job of of getting getting teams that they can beat. Uh, you know, out of conference. But besides that, I mean, it's a it's a tough one again. I mean, they're they're having to get a quarterback, which I think is kind of tough to say. That they're they're starting a new quarterback. Kyle Frazier is not there anymore, or at least probably not going to be the starter. Uh, you've got Jonathan Wallace, who I thought was the better quarterback last year, who had some good snaps, and he's going to be. Uh, it looks like he'll be the the first team quarterback right now. And other than that, I mean, who, it's just so hard to 
to tell how they're how they're going to do because it's such a different offense with Malzahn. Even though I know he was there a couple of years ago, their team last year was not a Malzahn offense, yeah. and and it just it totally depends on how how they take to that system. And I you know a lot of these are players that he recruited, so you would imagine that they would. Um, they would kind of take to it a little better than if he was going to an Arkansas or to a to a program that he hasn't been at before. So, well, that's kind of uh, where I think Frazier's got an advantage because I mean, like you said, he was recruited by Malzahn. He ran that style of offense in high school. Um, you know, I think he, that's going to bode well for him. But you know, the one thing that you don't think about is you got a freshman Jeremy Johnson coming in, and then you've got a JUCO guy Nick Marshall that I mean, you've got four guys competing really. Yeah. Uh, that quarterback spot, and and it is, it's up in the. I think it's truly up in the air. I think you're going to see some red shirts come down on a couple of these guys that that don't make the cut uh, for for Auburn in the quarterback position. But they've got a, a, a lot of talent to try to choose from. It's just which one's going to provide be the best one, uh, and it, it's it's going to be interesting to see what happens there in the quarterback position. Well, I know one of the big things is that that. Uh, Wallace was a little more of a runner than the other one, so I think that, that that could bode well. I mean, having that that running ability from your quarterback always always helps. If you you know if you're not the best passer, it's nice to be able to tuck it if, if everything breaks down. So we'll definitely see. I mean, I think that's the that's the hard part. Uh, the good thing is Trey Mason's coming back. He's going to be the starting running back. He was a thousand yard rusher in the SEC last year, so that that's a big one. And then and then they're you know they've got some talent. I mean, they've had good great recruiting classes the last few years. Uh, so you know that they they're going to be talented, uh, returning almost uh, what four of their five offensive linemen, and uh, and then their receivers are, are are new somewhat. But I mean, Quan Bray's a, a explosive guy who was a a big name recruit a few years ago. So I think they'll be more talented on offense, especially with Malzahn. And this is a team that I think it's going to be hard. You know, we always talk about going the over under on number of wins. Uh, it's going to be hard because I think that they they could they could have the kind of season like they had last year and they can win three games because their schedule's so hard. Or they could have, you know, they could be one of those teams that makes a big jump like an Ole Miss and they win seven or eight games, and you just kind of out of nowhere because it's just the way Malzahn's offense works. It's just it's kind of crazy, you know. So it, it just depends. I think that this is going to be a hard team to handicap with a with a new coach and not really knowing what to expect. I don't disagree with that. Uh, it, it's it's a team where you don't know what what you actually have, and they've not only recruited well, they've also got some good transfers. You know, they've got another running back, another power guy, uh, Cameron Artes Payne, uh, that that's coming in at running back to help. And and you're really going to see that, I think. I mean, even Alabama is a running back committee anymore. Uh, it, it's just not a one man show back there as a tailback. So you need that two or three. Uh, different types or looks from your running backs to give the guys uh, a breather or to give them a change-up look. You know, you need a speedy guy like Rudy, Rudy Ford out there uh, to change things up to be that Chris Johnson-type breakaway, get some, some big chunk-type runs, uh, but you also need that, that power power run game too. And so you get that balance back there in the running game. Uh, you get a, a, a quarterback that becomes the leader of the program uh, you you never know what can happen with Auburn, and and you know their schedule might prove that they could get to that bowl game. Uh, we could take a look at that. Unless there's any other players or, or things you want to mention about Auburn before we take a look at that schedule. Yeah, I and mean, we can look at it. I think the the tough thing with Auburn is you know it's it's good to always look at the last couple years, last two or three years with the program, and I really think that they're it's just so hard to tell what they were with Cam Newton because I think Cam Newton was worth. I mean, I think he was worth three or four wins for him. I mean, that, I mean, he's just – he's one of those players that it's just hard to – I mean, I mean, you can tell how much uh, – how big of a player he was. They won a national championship, and two years later, their coach is fired. So, obviously, he was a big a big player, and he, he meant a lot to him. You know, kind of as that one-year rental player, which you don't see in college football very often. So, it's kind of hard to, to tell what, you know, what he brings to the – you know, what this team's going to look like this year without a player like that. So, Let's just go through the lineup and see what we got. All right. Uh, we'll start off Washington State and Arkansas State. Any doubts there? There's there's a, a, a loss there? I think it's pretty uh, – in Arkansas State, that's just where, where Malzahn came from, right? So yeah. that's kind of crazy. I, I, you know, honestly, yeah, I mean, Washington State was supposed to be a lot better than they were last year. They were horrible last year, but they've got a – they've got um drawn a blank, uh, Mike Leach. Mike Leach is their head coach. That's going to be a fun game to watch. I mean, talk about having you know high explosive offenses. So you've got Washington State and Arkansas State. You got both of those at home, but 
I don't know. Arkansas State's been good the last few years. I mean, maybe they've got some holdovers. And and Malzahn, some of his crew took over that program, did they not? And they like that type of offense. So you're right. Uh, those can be two exciting games for Auburn fans. They, they're, they're not going to be uh, guaranteed victories, and they're not going to be um, handedly won from the beginning either. I think we will find out a lot about Auburn by those first two games. They could be 2-0. and They could be 0-2. They could be 1-1. and All those are, uh, are, are just – kind of up-in-the-air type uh, type game. So I think it's going to be fun to watch. Uh, Auburn seems to always have good games at the beginning of the year that are exciting to watch. So I guess we'll see um, We'll see pretty soon. Yeah. Uh, then then you're looking at Mississippi State. That's an early SEC matchup to get things kicked off. Uh, you know, Mississippi State was a program, uh, and Blair's not here to, to defend it, but I definitely think they – they did not do as well as they needed to the way they started the season last year. Uh, I think they, Mississippi State fans would have to consider their season a disappointment with the way they started and, and, and looked like they were going gangbusters. Would they get start off like 8-0? Uh, and then, then the, the wheels kind of fell off for that program. Uh, so they've got some things to, to try to prove. And, and Dan Mullen's got uh, you know somewhat of a – the seat's getting kind of warm, I think, down there in Mississippi State in that he's got to get over that hump. Uh, and <laughs> That's crazy because we're talking about you know how he could he could take the Penn State job if he wanted to all these things about him and you're right yeah I mean it's just they were they were seven and zero last year and then they they took a bad stretch but I mean yeah I mean they lost to Alabama Texas A and M LSU I mean that's just kind of their you're not going to win those games and that's what's tough but but yeah I agree with you that Mississippi State game I've got to believe and Blair would know so much more about this I've got to believe their defense is going to be worse because I mean they lost they lost their uh, two cornerbacks that got drafted I think in the second or third round of the NFL. I mean, that's just going to be hard to, to come back from that. So I think that that works out well for Auburn. I mean, that's another home game for Auburn. I think that's one that they could win, and that would be a, a nice win for the program. Yeah, I, I, I'm going to – I am gonna I might change this when I do the Mississippi State preview and hear Blair, you know, defend Mississippi State. He might talk me into it. But right now with, with him not being on the, on the podcast, I'm going to say it's Auburn's to win, uh, and they're going to start the season 3-0 and headed uh, – into Death Valley? Yeah. Yeah, they go to Death Valley. That's going to be a tough one. I think we both agree that that's going to be a loss or should be a loss. Old Miss, I think, is a pick em game at this point, don't you? I agree, yeah. I think that I mean, it's just hard for me to, to, to say Old Miss is a favorite over over Auburn. Um, but, that, I mean, they, last year, I mean, they, they actually they handled Auburn pretty well last year, won by 21 points. But I just think that that was a different team, and they kind of weren't playing for their coach. So we'll see what that does. If you had to pick it and had to had to have a winner in that game, who would you go with? I mean, before the season starts, I would take Ole Miss just because I know that you know they're the hot team last year and they they finished a lot stronger. And I haven't seen Mel's on, but I guess I would take Ole Miss. But it would be very very close. I'm gonna. I'll just. Uh, I, I don't want to disagree just to disagree because I, I I agree with you. I think you're looking at an Auburn program and they still have so much they have to prove. That you know, as we get into our weekly picks right before that game, I, I could definitely change. I could see myself changing my mind. But preseason, if you look at this game, you're going to have to give it to Ole Miss in the way that they came off of last year. Uh, they they performed so well. They they did did a lot of good things last year with that program. I'm going to have to I'm going to have to agree with you there. And and I'm going to give them the next one against Western Carolina. I don't think. Yeah, I think that that's a that's a no-brainer for them. But then well. then you, you give them a loss at te- at Texas A&M. Correct, and then yeah, I think then they, it's kind of good because they've got it broken up. They don't have that four-game stretch like uh, like Missouri did, because then they get FAU, and then they're playing at Arkansas, and I think that they can win both of those games. Um, a lot of toss-up games for Auburn, because I because I think that could go either way. It's one of those things where if I was picking, I would say they're going to win either the Mississippi State or the Old Miss game. They're going to win either the Washington State or the Arkansas State game. They're going to win either the Arkansas or the Tennessee game. You know, it's one of those things where. They don't have, you know, they're they're catching a break by playing uh, by playing Tennessee in the in the West or in the East, which is kind of crazy to say. I mean, Tennessee usually wasn't a break team, but you know, it's better than playing South Carolina or Florida. So, and maybe even Vanderbilt at this point. I, I can't imagine that that's true, but I won't say that. I'll never pick Vanderbilt to be better than Tennessee. That's ever. a st- tough pill to have to say, right? Uh, it's not true. I, I it's a guaranteed win. Tennessee will will throttle Vanderbilt this year. All right, mark it down right there. July July fourteenth, but but you're right. I you look at it, 
and there's there's a lot of games that could go either way here on this this program. Um, you know, if they if they if you say they split Washington, Arkansas State, um, then you've got Mississippi State, uh, Ole Miss. They're going to win one of those. Uh, I, I think there's we are with their overall record. That's two and two. Uh, Mrs. LSU is going to be a loss. That's two and three. Uh, Western Carolina, Florida Atlantic. That's should be big wins. So that's four and three. Is that right? Yeah. Four and four with Texas A&M. And then they've got Arkansas, Tennessee, Georgia, and Alabama. I, I think that you know it's a five and seven, six and six, seven and six type season. Yeah. Just right on that cusp. And they could, like I said, this is a team. I mean, and they could win. They could beat Washington State and Arkansas State and Mississippi State and Ole Miss and Tennessee and Arkansas. And next thing you know, they've got eight wins. So I think that's where it gets tough to predict. And that's why I'm saying they could be a three-win team. They could be an eight-win team. Don't, don't, I mean, that's just what's so difficult about the SEC. If you're looking at a program, I won't say there's two wins on the program. I think there's at least three wins with uh, with Auburn this year. But you're right; it could go. I think anywhere from three and seven. I won't go two and eight. I won't give them that large of a swing. But, but to have that even that big a swing as far as wins and losses, looking at it preseason, uh, you just never know what kind of program you're going to get. And I guess that's what's good about being an SEC fan of a particular program is every year. If we had an Auburn fan on here doing this podcast, you know that they were going to have them at eight, eight wins on sure. on, the, on those games. And that's that's the way it is with the, with. When you when you have your fans and you look at these games and, and objectively they have a case that they could say they that they could go with the win and, and I'd say yeah you could win that game you yeah, could lose that game too but you can win that game so, I, 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 think I think it's, it's a, a it's a tough one to, to to call and that's why I mean it's it's I'm, and I'm, I promise I'm not trying to just be wishy washy and you know I think that if you've ever listened to this podcast I'll give you my opinion and I I've been extremely wrong on some teams and I've been really right on some teams. This is just one that, you know, last year I, would, I didn't expect three and nine season from them. Uh, they've got too many, and, and they've just got too many big name recruits that, I mean, they, they they had, you know, top five recruiting classes in the past, and, and some of those guys are still there. And I look at the defense, and, you know, and I, I know a lot of the players' names, you know, a D Ford and a Gabe Bright. Um, these are guys that, you know, that you've heard of and that, that have you know, are big name players, and you just you think that they've got to they've got to you know live up to that potential, and if they do, they could be an eight win team. You know, as you as you said that, it made me think that you know there's probably two losses on that program last year, maybe more, where that team just gave up on their coach. Uh, you know, thinking about those games, uh, so I'm going to give them five wins last year. If you look at effort and and what they could have done and should have done. Uh, it wasn't that they got beat. I think they just didn't come to play. Uh, so now you're really just looking at can they get to, to an, one extra win this year over over what they were should have been able to do last year. And uh, looking at the schedule, it's going to take some things to go right, but Aubrey could do it. I don't know. Yeah, I agree. I, I hate being so middle of the road here, but it's just that this that's the way it is in the SEC is – is when you look at some of these mid-level teams, unless you're on that elite four or five programs, um, it could go either way almost any given week anymore. So. And they did. And last year they had some close games. I mean, they almost beat LSU last year, and they almost beat Vanderbilt last year. So, and then they, you know, of course they had a lot of, you know, games that went the other way. You know, getting shut out by against Georgia and against Alabama. I mean, you don't expect that. I couldn't imagine. You know, so it's. I think quitting on your coach was more. Their schedule was so hard last year. I mean, they had Clemson out of conference, and really the only wins they had were the other out of conference games. What was that Clemson score? What that that was late, wasn't it? Was it was a touchdown. Yeah, twenty six nineteen. Clemson won. So that was a close game. But you talk about like, I can't remember the last time Tennessee got shut out in a game, and to be shut out in back to back SEC games. I mean, they got outscored uh, eighty seven to nothing in their last two SEC games. So I think that that was kind of them giving up. I mean, yeah, and sandwich that with a win over Alabama A&M, which I'm pretty sure me, you, and Blair, and just people that have hosted the uh, the the podcast could could have played with Alabama A&M. So I don't um, even know if I could have played with Alabama. A&M. Maybe so. Who knows? So anywhere from three and nine to eight and four. I mean, if if you want, I'll put my number on it. I'll say. Um, 
I'll say five and seven. They miss out by one game. Damn it, dude, that's where I was going. I'll go six and six. I'm saying they're going to a bowl then. <laughs> but I wanted five and seven. <laughs> yeah, I just think that I don't know. I think that I think the fact that Washington State and Arkansas State are if they lose one of those games, watch out. That could be trouble. And I think those are going to be tougher games. And it's and it's early in the season, so that could be a, a precursor for things to come with those guys too. True, true. Now is that Washington State game? Is that going to be uh, like a, a kickoff? Is that one of the kickoff games? Uh, I doubt it. Um, I don't think so. I don't know where the like the you know the the ones that are in Atlanta usually. Uh, well, it doesn't have. I'm sorry, they don't have a time announced, so probably not. I think that would already be announced right now. Yeah. As far as what that goes, I should know that Chick Fil A kickoff game. Who is that going to be? Oh, that's a uh, Alabama and um, Virginia Tech. It's okay. one of them. There's a, there's a second one, is there not? Probably there was last year. There were two. There was Tennessee and C State was one. Uh, I'm trying to go to it, but I don't know. Wasn't it? And the other one was Clemson South Auburn. Carolina. Well, no, Clemson Auburn was the other one. Usually, it's an ACC SEC game. Vanderbilt South Carolina was uh, an early game. It was through the week. I only know that because I was in Memphis that day. No, so I can't. I, I can't pull it up right now. My iPad's not. It's all right. Cooperating. Nobody else cares. Nobody cares. You're right. Um, so that's the breakdown. Anything else you want to add? We'll do our open mic. No, I think that that's good. I, you know, once again, I, we know. The, for the the funny thing is for there's a few teams out there Auburn Missouri some of those if you, unless you're a big big name program or you're Tennessee Kentucky you know Mississippi State or if we get somebody that's you know we'll try most of the time we try to have you know an expert on one of the teams um, it doesn't always work out that way on the podcast but if you're an Auburn fan and and we're saying stuff that's you know we're, we're not following every day of you know summer workouts so uh, if you disagree just yell at us on on the YouTube or uh, on Twitter or somewhere like that, and tell us how stupid we are. And they but, can they can get you personally on Twitter with. Uh, you can follow me at Drew Young Twenty. All right. Uh, so on Twitter. I know it's been a, f- a few weeks. Anything you want to do cover on our open mic segment here? Uh, let's see. I had some good tweets the other day. Um, if you follow me, those were some good some good uh, some good thoughts about secondhand smoke and and. Um, I hate, you know, I'll just talk about this for a second. I hate when you go to, like, a bathroom, and I understand, I mean, you know me, Shane, I'm, a, I'm a definitely a green kind of guy, and I recycle and, and, and like conserving things, but I can't stand the the uh, automatic sensor on, like, uh, faucets and on the uh, the paper towel dispensers. I, like, I, I can assure you that I know how much paper towel, how many paper towels I need, and I have to sit there and put my hand under it like four times to get enough paper towels. So that's a pet peeve of mine. You know, I, I, I can't tell you the places I've been, but I really I didn't realize till just recently you can adjust the the length of the roll. You know, as as what it what it spits out. You know, so you can not get that little bitty short piece of paper where it does take you four or five. But you're saying not you as a consumer. You're saying you as a business owner, right? Correct. Yes. Well, yeah, they're gonna just they're gonna just screw you any way they can. Well, but it ends up costing them more because me and you and other and and ninety eight percent of the population get more than they need because they have to keep putting waving their hand over the plastic thing to to get what they need. That is true, but I do think I use more paper towel than the average person. I don't understand how somebody can use one paper towel to dry their hands. I feel like I have to use like six. Well, to me, it's a little bit like those uh, air dryer things. My hands aren't completely dry when I leave one of those places. I just you know I get the main moisture off of it and let the rest go. But now, from a, I, don't ask me where or how I know this, but uh, you actually reduce germs if you dry your hands completely uh, in the men's bathroom before you leave. Uh, that makes complete sense. So, there you go. Um, so, your your tip, healthy tip of the day from the, the <laughs> from SEC Sports Roundtable. There you go. Um, at my open mic segment. I'm going to talk about movies. I know you've done that. Um, on more than one podcast, but Harper, my, my oldest, turned six last week, uh, and we took her to the movies with her friends for a birthday party, and that, Drew, was the best. Uh, you know, you you got the jump houses and 
uh, the, the playgrounds and all these different things nowadays for kids to go have birthday parties. But, uh, you know, it was the first opening weekend of Despicable Me. So we were able to get the show times and, and get that out to everybody. We were able to bring in our own. My daughter hates cake for some reason. So we did one of those big birthday cookies. Uh, so we got to have it decorated and cut up all all in the in the movie theater section over to the side where they do the ice cream and stuff. So we had that little area all by ourselves. Nobody would ever come. Oh, okay. So you had the party in like the lobby of the of well, the movie theater. Most, most movie theaters are set up similar to like the the one we go to in Franklin. But if you go in, there's a room off to the right there where they have ice cream. And so they had tables and things set there. And nobody ever goes in that room. So we were able to have all the kids right there have their cake. We bought popcorn and divvied it up to all the kids and sprites into smaller cups so they could have, you know, their sodas and popcorn and went in, they, they sat down and we took up the whole row, watched the movie. It was the you know, you don't get this too many times that when your one of your child's friends go to a birthday party, they go, This is the best party ever. You know, you pick the right type of party. So it was pretty easy and simple for any parents that are out there that are thinking about what can I, what what's new and different to do is for a party. But uh, I know that's the first time we'd we'd heard of that or any of our friends do it. But uh, that worked out really really well. And, it was and you a good movie you probably enjoyed the movie, didn't you? It was a good movie. You know, grew grew's a, a character there. So if, if, that's the that's Steve, Steve Carell, right? Yes. Yeah. Well, good deal, man. Yeah, that sounds like that's like one of the only kids' parties I would enjoy going to is get to eat popcorn and you know watch a movie. So oh, I should have invited you. What you're saying? It's all right. No, no worries, man. Or like Twin Peaks, you could you could have had her party at Twin Peaks. That would have been great for me too. Uh, that that would have been great for me as well. That that was a runner-up place. <laughs> yeah, I got I got vetoed on that one. Yeah, that's the way it goes. I will say this: nobody cares, but congratulations. Hold on one second, Shane here. Yes. Ah, I know it's coming up. Ryder Cup of, uh, of Middle Tennessee. And the Drew Crew is the champions. If you can see the different colors on there, when my team wins, we get the black colored one. When the, my brother's team wins, they get the other one. This is our golf tournament. We uh, we won that. It was a good two days. And, uh, now, Henry, now, Henry let me interject real quick. This year's plaque is not on there. Is that correct? Correct. There's one more missing. I haven't got the other one yet. So it's so four out of five years. Yeah. There's a black one that's still set to come on there. Four out of five. Correct. And if, if Freddie Couples needs uh, some help with uh, the U.S. Ryder Cup team, I've got some experience as a, as a captain, so I'd be happy to help. Co-captain Drew Young. I would do it. I think I could do a good job, too, to be I honest. Would carry your clipboard if we did that? What's that? I want to carry your clipboard if you get asked. You can come, absolutely. Oh, it would be great too. This one's over. This is the next one's going to be like in Scotland. That'd be, that'd be wonderful. I'd be excited. With Freddie as coach, I don't know what I'd do. It's like, how cool would it be just to hang out with that cat? Yeah, you love Fred Couples. He's your favorite golfer too. So he is, of all time. Yeah, that so, would be. He's so effortless, you know. Freddie Boom Boom. Yep. All right, guys. Uh, you can follow me on Twitter at p shane bailey. That's my Twitter again. The roundtable is SCCSRT. That's our Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, uh, about anything else I can think of. Google Plus, we're all uh, on there as SCCSRT. So this podcast can be found anywhere that audio uh, podcasts are found or audio casts. And then a video version of this is posted on our YouTube channel here shortly. So, guys, with that, we're going to call this podcast done.